Welcome back. Uh, I'm Alfred Weber, and we're here with the Reverend Kevin Annett, who is the acting secretary of the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State. Welcome, Kevin. Hi, Alfred. Now, I, I understand that uh, you, together with the Association of uh, Citizens, uh, have have taken an important step in the Federal Court of Canada, and I wondered if you could bring us up to say up up to date on that. I will, Alfred. It's a very historic step because for the first time in Canada and really anywhere, the Crown of England and the Vatican have both been named in a criminal conspiracy lawsuit. This was a suit initiated on July fourth in the Federal Court in Canada in in Toronto, Canada. And what it does is it names the, the Crown, uh, the Pope, the Queen of England, the Government of Canada, uh, the United Catholic and Anglican Churches, and pharmaceutical corporations in a criminal conspiracy uh, going back more than a century. It also names them as being involved in a massive obstruction of justice. And some examples of what we're, we're naming there is, for example, the attempt by the government to conceal the full magnitude of the crimes that occurred in the Indian boarding schools, the uh, collusion between big pharmaceutical companies like GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, and the Catholic Church, which has numerous investments in these companies, uh, collusion between the big pharma and the churches to actually test drugs on generations of captive children, not just Indian children, but those in Catholic orphanages, hospitals, things like that. So it's, a, it's an enormous criminal lawsuit, and... The encouraging thing that happened the other day is Jason Bowman, who brought the the action in federal court, was actually given a green light by a judge there to act to come in this coming week on July 9th and begin the process of getting direction from the judge as to the full magnitude of, of this kind of case. So uh, the door hasn't been shut on us right away, which is a surprise, and we're very encouraged. So Jason's in federal court in Canada today in Toronto arguing that 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 motion. Well, that's right, and also uh, getting direction from the judge as to, for example, should there be other parties named? Uh, what is the right procedure to follow? The interesting thing about the federal court in Canada is it can issue direct indictments, and in other cases brought before it in before their criminal trial division, they have uh, judges have been able to issue arrest warrants simply on the basis of one affidavit and one eyewitness. And so we certainly have enough evidence to convince a neutral and fair-minded judge that, yes, a lot of children died as a result of this collusion. The crimes are being covered up systematically by the government and churches of Canada. And there's uh, heads of state that are complicit in this crime. So we'll see what happens. But it's, um, you know, very encouraging that this is kind of a new uh, front in which we're opening. And uh, if people are interested in that, we're posting the regular news about that on our website, which is itccs.org. Jason Bowman is the uh, head of the Association of Citizen Prosecutors in Ontario. And it's a, a citizens group. He's not a lawyer, but he's well versed in common law and legal procedure. And he is actually initiating this with me. We're the two uh, co-plaintiffs acting on behalf of both the ACP and the ITCCS. But it's also a class action. So, in fact, we're inviting anybody who's been uh, harmed by uh, criminal conspiracy actions by church and state or church, state, and big pharma to come forward and become part of this class action suit. So this could be potentially very big and involve many hundreds of people. Right. So, for example, uh, would survivors of residential school abuse or genocide, I mean, they're, they're uh, the, you know, the families of victims, uh, be able to join this, this suit. Absolutely, Alfred. As a matter of fact, they're one of the main groups we're asking to join because up until now they have not had their fair day in court. This whole history of genocide and criminal action has been cast as a civil action in the Canadian courts as if it was just a matter of damages that could be settled with a certain amount of money. Uh, when children are being sterilized and tortured to death and buried in mass graves after they die, when 50,000 or more go missing, that is not a civil action, that's a criminal action, and yet no criminal court has ever heard that 
case argued before it in Canada. And so, you know, this is uh, a way, in other words, for justice to finally be done after a lot of whitewash and miscarriage of justice towards Aboriginal people. Now, is some of the evidence that you've been uncovering in Brantford, Ontario, at a residential school and elsewhere, uh, that there are discovery actions going where there have been human remains of children who have been genocided at the Aboriginal school, at the First Nation school that was operated by the Anglican Church. Is that evidence being brought into this action, for example? Yes, it is. We intend to bring forward the forensic uh, analysis that's been done on bones that have been discovered at the, the Mohawk Institute run by the Church of England. Uh, we also are bringing forward expert testimony in the form of technicians who operated ground penetrating radar, elders who authorized the dig and the, the survey of the school. Also in Ontario this last week, independently of what happened at the Mohawk Institute, uh, there's a group of Ojibwe parents of children who disappeared at another Church of England school uh, in Sioux Lookout. And um, that, those people on their own went out and found the bones of their relatives who died in 1956, buried on the grounds of the, uh, the Anglican Residential School in Sioux Lookout. And they're bringing that evidence. We hope to get them to, uh, to bring that evidence because clearly when they, it was interesting when they found the bones of these children and they were positively identified, they were burnt, which is often the condition of bones you find at residential school sites because often the children's bodies were incinerated and, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the school furnace, there have been many eyewitness accounts of that happening. Well, finally, we have the physical proof to confirm that. So, yes, it's going to be a real centerpiece of, of some of the evidence we're going to be bringing in to this uh, federal case. Yeah. So, so what, do you, uh, what do you anticipate are, are the first steps? Well, after getting the proper direction from the judge, uh, hopefully, in the best case scenario, we'll have leave to proceed. And so what we'll do at that point is Jason and I will present our affidavits and evidence. We'll ask for summonses to be issued uh, to uh, Elizabeth Windsor, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the Pope and the, the Queen of England, uh, Stephen Harper and his ministers, the heads of the Catholic, Anglican, and United Churches in Canada, the superintendent of the RCMP, executive officers of big pharma corporations. Now, I don't want to mention who they are at this point, uh, but these are fairly major pharmaceutical companies. And um, also, for example, Murray Sinclair, who's head of the so-called Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is this government and church-sponsored whitewash going on, he'll have to answer hard questions as to why, for example, native eyewitnesses to murder are being systematically gagged at Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, forums, not allowed to name names. Evidence is not allowed to be taken down of criminal actions that occurred in the school. They'll have to ask why this obstruction of justice is going on. They'll have to answer uh, those hard questions of, of how and why they, they get the authority to block that kind of uh, that uh, truth coming out. So all of those people will be named and, and even more church and corporate officials. What is the latest news that, that you hear from uh, your colleague and co-plaintiff Jason Bowman. Well, he's just very excited. Uh, he's uh, this is went it went further on his first round than he thought it would. He's preparing uh, today. I haven't heard from him yet. Uh, I'm sure by tomorrow I will. But when we get that news, we intend to post it regularly uh, at itccs.org. So after this broadcast is up, you can simply go there to, uh, to look at the latest updates as to what exactly the judge is saying about our our case and um, and you know matters related to that. Yeah. Now, now, how do you see William Coombs, who was a direct eyewitness in 1964 to the disappearance of 10 First Nations children in Kamloops, BBC, who were taken by Elizabeth Windsor and her consort, uh, Prince Philip, to an alleged picnic and had never been seen again in their lives. And when he was going to give testimony in the UK before the ITCCS, uh, he mysteriously died. Uh, is that matter going to come into the federal court action, for example? 
Absolutely it is. We intend to name the Vancouver police as being complicit in his death, along with Bingo Johnny Dawson and Ricky LaValle, two other Native people who we believe were killed through foul play, just like William. We'll be issuing summonses to the chief of police in Vancouver and others uh, in St. Paul's Hospital, a Catholic hospital, where we believe William was given the injection that led to his death. And um, the whole matter of the police attacks on Native people today is going to be uh, addressed, it, you know, as part as part of our uh, our suit. So yes, that whole issue is going to be looked at in de in detail. What they were able to witness and why they were killed and the circumstances of their deaths. Well, the first case, uh, Johnny Bingo Dawson was a leader of our movement in Vancouver. He was a native man, a survivor of the Church of England residential school in Alert Bay. He was leading um, with a lot. A lot of native people in Vancouver living on the street were part of the groups that were going into churches in 2008 and 2009. And um, they were leading church occupations, demanding the return of the children who died in the residential school for there to be full forensic inquiries. Bingo was threatened by the Vancouver police for doing that. Uh, I was there one day when that actually happened. A Vancouver sergeant said to him, troublemakers like you go missing. And I was just a few feet from him when that police sergeant said that to Bingo. Uh, December 6, 2009, he was beaten by three police in the alley in Vancouver. He uh, died two days later. The coroner's report said alcohol poisoning, but the toxicology report accompanying that said there was no alcohol or drugs in his system. Ricky Lavalle witnessed the beating and began to speak about it. He, too, was threatened by the police to be quiet about what he saw. On January 3rd of this year, he died. And the only cause of death that's been uh, mentioned so far has come from the family. The coroner has yet to release a report six months later uh, about Ricky, but the only thing the family say about it is it was a lung hemorrhage, uh, which, of course, can come from a blow to the chest, can come from any number of things. So, no, in all of these cases, the reality is Native people are on the front line. They're easily killed off, and nobody really cares. And many of the eyewitnesses to these, these crimes in residential school and to the disappearance of, of Native women the complicity of the RCMP and the serial killings that have been going on, all of that is known by the people, the eyewitnesses who are living on the street, and they're the ones who often go missing, and I think that's, that's not accidental. Now, in the federal case, uh, uh, in the initial papers name uh, secret societies and secret conspiracies that go back a number of hundred years. Uh, that fuel the motivation for the genocides. Could you talk a bit about those? Well, I can't talk in detail because that's an aspect of the case that Jason has prepared, so I don't want to misquote I him. See. But I can tell you generally that he does mention uh, Freemasonry. He shows the number of Canadian prime ministers, uh, federal court judges, Supreme Court judges, and Royal Canadian Mount of Police superintendents who are all Masons who, of course, have a secret oath to protect each other. Um, and so I think, to some degree, the crimes that happen in Indian boarding schools, hospitals, and, and similar facilities definitely have a cultic aspect to them. I've known that for a number of years, having eyewitness, eyewitnesses spoken to me about ritual, cult ritual abuse activity they witnessed, including child sacrifice, uh, marking children with certain insignias, the burial of uh, children in certain configurations in the cemeteries, and, and similar kinds of tales. So I think that there's that whole element that will be explored as well. Now, uh, if we look at the Robert Pickton matter here in Vancouver, uh, an extraordinary number of his victims were First Nations women who were abducted against their will and murdered at, at his farm, will that matter, is that matter part of the court filing or not? Yes, the, the missing women in, on the West Coast is uh, also going to be part of the, the case presented. We already have a number of the relatives of these missing women coming and uh, going to be part of our class action suit. Not only because of the fact of how it shows a pattern of certain groups in the Native community that historically been targeted, and we're talking specifically about the hereditary chiefs. Many of the original Native women who went missing were from the hereditary bloodline. 
who have always been targeted by both, not only the government and churches of Canada and the RCMP for, for killing, but also the collaborating native chiefs who, um, you know, the early Indian families who were Catholicized and then sent into the villages to kill the indigenous chiefs and put themselves in in, in their stead. The, all of that colonial history is going to be looked at and how it's linked today to the ongoing disappearances. So definitely that part, especially considering the whitewash of the Picton Inquiry, where just when it began to get close to revealing how RCMP members were seen bringing women to the snuff film operations the Picton Brothers were operating, it was shut down. The government inquiry was shut down as soon as that evidence began to come out. So we will definitely take up where that left off. You were involved also in 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 bringing direct uh, in bringing witnesses who were were able to name names of officers, I believe, and and uh, uh, of other perhaps health angels or. Well, that's right, Alfred. Not only the the names of Mounties and policemen involved with the the Hell's Angels and the drug and the snuff film operation, but also what's interesting is what came out in the course of interviewing people was that the there are even crown counselors, uh, the the woman who was the crown counsel who actually stayed the charges against Willie Picton initially, and the lawyer for Picton, it turns out were both shareholders in what's called Eternal Holdings, which is the the company that owns the property where the Pic Picton's operation uh, is based. So it looks like the Crown agents themselves are complicit, not just the Mounties, but lawyers and politicians were involved in, in this operation. There was some mention of it when the re recordings of Picton's cellmate, who was an undercover RCMP officer, were made public, that perhaps there were ritual murders of some of the women there. Is that something that, that you've come across? Apparently, the Picton brothers were what's called the just the disposal unit. They were occasionally killing women. By and large, they were simply cutting up the bodies and, and getting rid of them. The actual killings and ritual murders and, and the snuff film operations were actually happening at another location in Port Coquitlam. I see. Which, according to these witnesses, involved very wealthy and powerful players. They mentioned the names of a couple of Canadian senators, a former mayor of Vancouver, and other politicians and military personnel, including... Uh, people who have stood trial before, you know, for uh, killing killing others. Uh, so all of that is going to come out. In other words, the Pictons were, to some degree, Willie Picton is simply the fall guy. They were the, the maintenance men in an operation that included uh, much more powerful people who we hope to name. Now, uh, there are also some Bilderberger members among these, correct? That's right. Uh, yeah, member... Two politicians in particular who are members of the, the Bilderberg were mentioned as, as being involved in that, that uh, wealthy home in Port Coquitlam where the killings occurred. Right. So, so that this, this now uh, is an opportunity under the jurisdiction of the Federal Court of Canada to bring all of this evidence that has been gathered by the Interna International Tribunal into crimes of church and state for examination. That's right, and, and that fact alone means we anticipate that there will be major attempts to derail our application to shut down this case. I mean, we're not naive. We know who we're dealing with here. Already at our press conference, a trained Asian provocateur came, was spreading lies and rumors about both Jason and myself, there's been more smears and misinformation going out this past week over the internet about me and Jason than any time in the last number of years. So definitely the, uh, the counterattack has already begun, and we assume that's going to intensify. So it makes it all the more important for people to rally around this, the, this case now so it can't be shut down. Right. So people who wish to support... Uh, the work of the tribunal and your work as co-plaintiffs in this federal action, how, how can they do that? They can contact me directly, uh, hiddenfromhistory1, that's the number one, hiddenfromhistory1 at gmail.com. 
Uh, you can also phone me, 250-591-4573. That's 250-591-4573. Our websites as well, itccs.org. And a lot of the evidence of these crimes in Canada are posted at hiddennolonger.com. Good. Well, we hope that you will come back frequently to give us updates on this continuing action. Thank I you. I sure will. Thank you, Alfred. Certainly. We've been with the Reverend Kevin Annett, who is Acting Secretary of the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State. Thank you.